I'm Ruth Hodges, and I'm speaking to you this morning um, with the Major John Buttrick House behind me, and we are in Minuteman National Historical Park in Concord, Massachusetts. Now, our tutorial this morning is going to be about neckwear, um, the cloths that, that both men and women wore um, around their necks. And when you think about yourself as a living historian and a visitor walks up to you, the first thing they're going to notice is your upper body, your face, your head, your neck. So they're going to notice a cap or a hat that you might have on your head if you happen to be wearing glasses, um, perhaps some jewelry, and definitely your neckwear. Now, why is your neckwear so important? The neckwear is important because it says a lot about who you are as a person. And getting those details right is really important because depending on your impression, your neckwear is going to be altered. And now we're going to be talking about the neckwear of the gentleman, of the upper sort. I have with me here a park ranger, Jared Foos, and he's going to be my model. So what he's wearing right now is a stock. Um, and this would fit very snugly around the neck, very neatly, um, noth nothing loose hanging out. Um, and the shirt that he's wearing it over would uh, almost always have a ruffle down the bosom slit. Um, the one he happens to be wearing right now does not, so you have to use your imagination a little bit, but imagine a little ruffle up at the top, or perhaps he'd unbutton a few buttons and the ruffle would be showing there. And often he would also have um, a ruffle at the end of his sleeve. And here you can see what a neck stock that is not on the neck looks like. It has a bit of stiffening in it. It's finely pleated. It would be made of very fine linen. And then it would close with a clasp or a buckle. In this case, we have a, a brass clasp. And sometimes I would like to mention that the, um, the collar would uh, fold out over the, the stock itself. Not to cover it completely, not at all. You would still see the nice pleated stock. But um, you might see an inch or so of it. Again, very neatly just hanging out over and flattened up against the neck. So again, the neat, formal look of a gentleman. And now I'm going to be talking to you about what a middling sort um, man would have worn. Um, this is called a, a neck cloth. So it's a long rectangle. Um, you can see it's quite long. I think it may be about 60 or so inches long and maybe 6 to 12 inches wide. This one happens to be made of silk but um, they also could be made of a very fine linen. You just don't want something that's too bulky because you're going to end up with a lot of fabric around your neck. So this is nice and um, smooth. So I'll show you how to put it on. Um, there isn't sort of one way to tie it. There isn't a formal way to tie it like a, a modern necktie where you actually there is a way to do that. Um, but I found looking at the images that um, there are certain ways that make it look appropriate. So what I've done is I've started it in back and depending on the size of your neck, you may want to start it in front and see how many times you need to wrap it around. So you go around, again, you want very snug. You want to make sure that your, the collar of your shirt is pulled upward. The knot should not, be, it's just, you don't want to think of this as a modern necktie. You really want to think about wrapping that high collar. Um, and then what I've done, one of the ways I've figured out to knot it is to not do a square knot, which is sort of right over left and then left over right. What I've done is, so I'll do right over left, and then I do right over left again. Now this isn't a prescription, this is just one of the ways I've figured out to do it. Again, we want it to be nice and snug. And then you often see this sort of little poof here. Um, and it might be often, actually, is tucked in. So you see like a little poof of that sort. Or particularly on an older gentleman, a, more, a little more old fashioned style would be maybe a couple of buttons undone and then it has this little bit of fringe here. And sometimes you see that fringe even stuck through a buttonhole um, and pulled out. May seem a little bit odd to us, but you actually do see that. Um, and it's also possible that the cravat could be in black. So the neck cloth or the cravat is sometimes called um, could be in a black. This is very much the same. Um, it's silk, but it doesn't have the fringe on it. Less common for sure. The white neck cloth is definitely more common, um, but this would be an, a very common look for a middling man. 
So another option for the middling man is to use a handkerchief, which is a square, rather than the, the net cloth, which is a long rectangle. It gives very much the same look when it's tied this way with a little hoof in the front. This is what um, Jared is wearing right now is this very, oh, another handkerchief just like this one. So it's a nice big square, very soft cotton. It doesn't have to be silk. It can be fine linen as well, perhaps even a Lindsay Woolsey, but something is fine that isn't going to be bulky around the neck. Remember to pull that collar up um, nice and uh, snug and high, and then wrap it around your neck, not at the base of the neck, but around the stem of the neck. So now what I'm showing you here on Jared is the lower sort, more for the laboring classes. Um, a more colorful patterned handkerchief um, would have been far more common and more useful and practical for someone who's doing labor. Wouldn't have to worry so much about getting it clean. You remember previously when I talked about for the middling sort that it would often be white. White, it would be a way of showing that you're respectable, that you have a way to do laundry and to do it well, whereas someone in the laboring class would often have these patterned handkerchiefs. It's a handkerchief that's, that's square, folded on the diagonal, rolled up, uh, tied snugly around his neck with a square knot. Um, another style that um, is more sort of sailor fashion, if you will, sailors tend to wear they have their own sort of style of doing things. And if you happen to be portraying a sailor, it's, I'm going to put it on over this one. He wouldn't have had two on necessarily, but um, it was kind of almost more worn like a, a, what we think of a woman's handkerchief in that it is out, um, not rolled up into something snug around the neck and a little more loosely tied, um, a little more flamboyant, if you will. So that might be, if you can imagine this one um, without this one underneath that would be sort of more of a, a sailor style. There are various ways that patterned or colorful handkerchiefs were made in the 18th century. One was um, a process called resist dyeing, and it would often make um, very common were spotted patterns, sometimes just an even spotted pattern as this blue and white one. Very common was red and white spotted ones. This is another even one. This one has um, various patterns within the spots, and this one even has a spotted border on it. Um, as I said, red and white, very common for the time period. Um, a second type of fabric for having a colorful handkerchief would be yarn dyeing. So this is a yarn, these are both yarn dyed linen. Um, yarn dyed means that the yarns were dyed ahead of weaving. So what will happen when you weave it in is you get either stripe patterns or you might have what we today call a plaid, but then it would have been called a check. And then finally, another common technique for making patterns or, um, and colorful handkerchiefs would have been doing uh, using block prints. So here are various colors of block prints, a pink one with a gold border, a blue with a, a black uh, block printing on it and sort of a diamond pattern. And then oddly enough, um, I found a number of these handkerchiefs that have a yellow background with a red, or in this case, it's a somewhat pinkish uh, dot pattern with a border on it. Um, and I don't think that's a color combination that you would see very often today, but something I've noticed in quite a few extant images. In conclusion, I'd like to emphasize that there are no hard and fast rules in um, the way your neckwear is worn or what type of neckwear you wear. There were definitely overlaps, so it depended very much on what your impression is and what you as, as that, that person that you're portraying is doing, where you are, all of those things. The context really is extremely important when you decide what sort of neckwear you're putting on, as it is with all of your outfits. And finally, I'd like to point out that this is a really easy and kind of fun and also an inexpensive way to improve your impression. So have fun with it.